Okay, great. Finally, a uh, uh, controversial talk. Uh, we've been waiting for one <laughs> all week long. Um, so next up, Bradley Cooney is speaking about the Supreme Court of DFSG3, um, which covers holes in the FTP master process, from what I gather <laughs> in, the <laughs> in, the, in the description. And uh, hopefully there's a few good um, angry FTP masters in the room. So uh, um, we'll have some mics available, because Bradley said it's interactive talk, so I think you can ask questions yeah. during the talk. Uh, well, thanks. Well, uh, it's interactive at the end. Let me, let me get through it. I, it's been a long time since I gave a talk uh, this uh, uh, controversial. I, I, I am known for giving controversial talks, but I don't give them as much as I used to, and so I am a bit nervous, so I hope you'll let me get through my slides to the end, and I'll, I'll leave time at the, at the end for you all to yell at me. Um, so first of all, uh, I put a lot of, I, I'm talking about a lot of history, uh, particularly one story that I'm going to tell. Um, so there are links to sort of all the mailing list posts and bug tickets that I've uh, referenced here. Anything in blue on my slides is a link. So you can load that URL, and there's a shortened URL if you don't want to have to type that big, long string that I put up there. So it's, uh, the, the shortened one is uh, ur1.ca slash pfcpb. That's Uniform Romeo One dot Charlie Alpha slash Papa Foxtrot Charlie Papa Bravo. Papa Foxtrot Charlie. Uh, pop. Uh, <laughs> the, the, it's it's one dot com slash Papa Foxtrot Charlie Papa Bravo. You're welcome. So before I start, uh, are there FTP masters and/or FTP assistants in the room? And I'd like to ask you to raise your hands. Other than I knew Luke was here, but. Um, okay. Oh, hi. Hi. I'm sorry. I don't know your. I don't know if I know your name. Chris. Chris. Okay. So, are you an assistant or a master? Assistant. Okay. But there's no FTP masters in the room. Okay. That'll make it a little easier. Um, are there ones on IRC? Let me know if ones on IRC start screaming. Um, so, <laughs> I, I actually my goal here is not to say things have been done poorly up till now. In fact, from my point of view, things have been done beautifully, and I'm going to explain why in a minute. Um, but I. While I've benefited from the current structure uh, in my political aims, I think that I gamed the system a few times. Uh, certainly one time that I can tell the long story of. And I think it's possible for others to game the system as well. And I think at the moment, I don't, the, just, somebody was just saying before the talk started, the new queue is empty. I don't believe there's a con contentious licensing decision before Debian right now. So this, in some sense, is the perfect time to talk about, do we have the right system for considering what is DFSG free uh, when there's no contentious issue before us? That's the time to think about, hey, maybe for the next time when a contentious licensing issue comes up, we should maybe have a different process. I want to, it's the very long, longest disclaimer slide I've done in a while. Um, this is really, I mean, our slides are on conservancy you know, you know, branding, but this is absolutely my own opinion. It's abs just as a private free software citizen. Um, I didn't even discuss the views of my employer. Karen left yesterday, and I had not written the slide yet. Uh, she was on chat this morning, but I did not show her the slide link. I almost did and decided not to. Um, <laughs> so, um, she's, in, she's in the London airport right now, actually, on her layover. Um, so I, you know, th these are all my views. Uh, I have political views about pretty much everything. These are my political views about the Debian DFSG pro process, and I added this one just a minute ago. I, I, someone in the front desk just to get ready, right, just accused me of being a lawyer again. I'm always accused of being a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. I've spent far too much time in my life around lawyers. I realize I sometimes sound like one because I've picked up affectations and other ways of speaking from them. But I'm a developer. I have a master's degree in computer science. I used to write code for a living. Uh, it's been a long time. Perl 5 is my best language, if that tells you anything. Um, but uh, but, uh, but I, yeah, I'm more of a, a computer geek than, than a lawyer, for sure, and I definitely don't want to be a lawyer. But I also think Debian is incredibly special, not just technically as a computer scientist, but also as a policy wonk. Debian is the most democratic software freedom project that has ever existed in the history of free software, period. There's, there's no question in my mind, and it's, it's not even close. That I don't know who the second most democratic one is. I can't even think of who it might be, because it's so far behind Debian's level of democracy. And it has codified policies that are clear, that are putting forward what the citizens of Debian care about, and the de citizens of Debian care about these policies. People argue about whether they should raise a general re resolution about something. That's true, interactive, and 
engaged democracy. If you have a democracy, though, you have a political structure. You have politics. Uh, and uh, politics is somewhat of a dirty word sometimes. People say, well, if you're a politician, which I admit, I'm primarily, I'm not a lawyer. I am a politician. Uh, I didn't mean to be one, but I am one. But politics is not necessarily bad. And these are the key issues, I think, that come up in software freedom politics. Uh, this happens in Debbie all the time. People make uniform decisions that apply to all members of the group. And there is a use of power. Now, the power is granted from the, from the developers. But the power affects the behavior of other people because there are people in positions of governance. So by the simple definition of politics, at least Wikipedia's definition, Debian is a political environment with politics going on all the time. The license approval process is no different than any other political structure in Debian. Licenses, though, themselves are also their own type of political document. They are, for other free software projects, pretty much all they have by way of a constitution. The license is their constitution. And the set, the meta set of licenses that we accept as open source and free software form kind of a meta constitution. It is the group of licenses we consider acceptable to have free software communities built around. And therefore, DFSG becomes an incredibly important document of itself at that meta level. It's helping decide, not just for Debian, but for an entire free software community, what licenses we consider right to create these communities around. And so Debian uh, likes to believe its politics and policies are about its own project, but there are ramifications of almost every major Debian decision across the free software world. I have for years, I, I'm only in like the last year been getting really, basically since my keynote last year and spending time with all of you here at DevConf last year, I've gotten excited and interested in Debian. I'm trying to get more engaged. I'm, I'm, in, in, I'm in the early stages, actually. <laughs> Sorry, my, my AM's right there. Um, of my, my uh, non-uploading DD application. And I, I want to get more engaged in Debian because I'm so excited about its democracy and, and so forth, particularly in the past year. But for years and years before that, I've closely followed Debian because it's politics. So goes Debian, so goes the free software world. So it has always been a thing as a free software politician I've had to keep a very close eye on. Um, so years ago, I guess what's this, uh, four years ago now? A little over four years ago. Richard Fontana, people, who in the room does not know who Richard Fontana is? OK, so Richard Fontana is a lawyer. He actually is a lawyer. Um, I worked with him uh, when we were both at the same job long ago. These days, he works for Red Hat. Um, and like me, he's kind of a policy wonk. He thinks very deeply and carefully about issues of policy and free software. And he gives pretty excellent talks about uh, various different issues of policy. Um, he's one of these people who only gives each talk once, generally speaking. I give my talks over and over. I reuse them. I won't be able to reuse this one because this is very Debian specific, and you all have heard it at that point or watched the video. But, uh, but, but this, I wish he had given this talk more often. He gave it exactly once, and there's a link to his slides and a link to an LWN article there that was written about the talk. And he, he is somewhat of a gadfly. So he tends to just raise issues and raise specter of concern without really proposing specifics. Uh, he will probably agree with me about that. But his talk uh, really got me thinking again about this issue of who decides what is an open source and free software license. And I was pretty convinced by his talk that we need continuing multiple bodies that are ruling about licenses. We have two that have always done it, FSF and OSI. I think the third is pretty obviously Debian. I've gone back and forth about whether Debian, uh, over the last you know, 20 years, whether Debian should be the third. I think I'm pretty convinced. Debian is the third, easily the close third to, say, OSI or FSF, as far as making decisions about what's a free software license. So enter the story that led me to think so much about this issue. So there's a license called the Afero GPL. Uh, who, in the, who in the room is completely unfamiliar with the Afero GPL? Raise your hand. OK, it's OK. I, I just wonder how quickly or slowly to go through this slide. So Afero GPL is, a, is basically a um, soft fork, if you will, a modified version of the regular GPL. It's specifically designed for issues of software freedom on a network service. So historically, the GPL has been focused on the issue of 
distribution or conveying software to another person. When you give them a copy, you must also give them all the source code and the ability to rebuild it and so forth. A Faro GPL extends that copy left requirement to networks. So it says if you give a user legitimate access on a network to your software, you must also give them an opportunity to receive the complete corresponding source for that particular network application. So I actually fought pretty hard to try and add the Afero clause to GPL proper. Uh, there was actually a, a meeting in 2002 where Richard Stallman wanted to release GPL v2.2 uh, with the Afero clause in it at that time. And uh, I actually took the wrong side at that time. I, we tried to convince Richard Stallman to wait and do a GPLv3 process, which we eventually had. I wish I'd taken the other side in that meeting, because maybe the Afero clause would be in the main GPL. But it's not. It's a separate license compatible with GPL that adds this clause. And I am incredibly biased on this point. I invented the idea behind how the Afero GPL works. It's my one contribution to the idea of copyleft. Stallman invented the idea of copyleft, and it's a stroke of genius. I wouldn't call this a stroke of genius, but it's a nice little tweak on the idea of copyleft, and I'm proud of it. And so I have a vested interest in the uh, advancement and proliferation of the Afero GPL and its widespread use. Now, FSF has been a license, it's probably the first license authority. I, I think that's, it's not probably, it's definitely, FSF was the first. Uh, in fact, one of the first things I did as a volunteer for the FSF in the mid-1990s was answer the general contact email that people would email in. And most of the questions in the, at the time, you know, 1995, 1996 era, were, is this license that I found a free software license? And so I was the first person to, sort of, to propose, hey, we should put together a license list on the website. I mean, this is 1997, 6, 7, right? Not every organization had a website in those days. FSF did. It wasn't you know, it was, you know, just a straight HTML site. But I said, hey, we should put this on the web. I actually had to convince Stallman, like, yeah, it really does need to be on the web. And was, we had a conversation about that. So yeah, yeah, that's where it needs to be, where everybody can go and look at it on the website. So we put that list up as the known free software license list. Uh, and then it's continued to be improved over the uh, decades. And FSF, of course, is the drafter and publisher of the Affair GPL. So of course it's on the free software license list. FSF would not publish a license it didn't believe is a free software license. But I'd be the first to admit, even though I'm on the board of directors of the FSF, FSF's biased in looking at its own licenses. That's, that's obvious. If you, if you write a license and you say, I think this license is a free software license, of course you do. You wrote it. There's bias there. So we almost can't trust FSF's opinion on its own license. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious to me, even though my heavy affiliation with FSF, you need another party to view it and say, is it really a free software license? So the obvious authority for it to be submitted to is the Open Source Initiative, OSI, which maintains the list of what is an open source license. So in 2007, November 2007, the Affero GPL was finally released. It actually came out almost a year after the original GPL, or the original GPL v3, rather. Um, and a company that wanted to use the Affero GPL, an employee of that company, submitted it to the OSI for consideration just a few months later, or actually a month and a half later. And almost immediately, Chris DeBona, uh, the head of Google's open source program office, replies saying, I don't think we should make this an open source license. There's going to be a huge debate because this is a total change to poly you know, usual things people say about the Affero GPL. Yet, I, I looked at the timestamps last night. I mean, look how many hours it was between <laughs> Chris's post of, we really need to have a big discussion about this, to the subcommittee approves it. I mean, it was, it was a matter of hours. Uh, and not only that, a couple days later, the OSI board endorses the committee's recommendation. So, and this is happening like that. And of course, I'm, I'm like, I'm watching this go by. I'm like, yeah, done, we're done. We made it, we made it. Um, well, I quickly learned that Chris was not happy. Google was not happy. Google was against the Faro GPL for the obvious reasons, right? They would never take it. They, I mean, they still to this day will never. A Faro GPL is verboten in all of Google. And Chris was really unhappy in particular. I, I think reasonably so. There was no public discussion about Faro GPL uh, really on the OSI's list. There was one troll who showed up. You, the, the threads are there. You can read them. Uh, who tried to troll about it a little bit. He actually got, that was the last straw for that particular troll, and he got kicked off the list over this. So the discussion was quelched because there was this troll that they had to get rid of, and then nobody wanted to say anything more, and then it's just approved. So 
there was actually work going on behind the scenes to try and convince OSI's board to reconsider. To at least, so it was said, temporarily, you know, the, the decision went too fast. So temporarily take it off the open source license list. Let's think about whether we really want the Affero GPL there. Now, my figuring was this is a perfect political move. It, temporary often becomes permanent in politics if the politics don't go your way. So a temporary removal, in my view, was a permanent removal. So I really had to prevent this. Meanwhile, there was, had already been, basically right at Affero GPL's release, a rather complex debate on Debian legal. And there was kind of a, a consensus on Debian legal that it was non-free. Um, I call it a manufactured consensus because there were two particular people, which you can read in the, uh, in the links, uh, who were really f kind of going back and forth off each other to convince the community that it was non-free. And I didn't know Debian very well as far as its politics in those days. And I actually thought a consensus on Debian legal had some sort of binding. Um, <laughs> So I was a little worried. Um, I thought there was, a, and even after people told me, I started asking my friends who were Debian developers, and they said, oh, no, 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 it's fine. I, but I figured it had some authority, right? I, I, I mean, I guess I really was naive. I was like, well, it, has, it must have some weight that this mailing list kind of came to a consensus. It is the Debian dash legal mailing list, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so, um, so uh, but besides, once I even knew Debian legal was not too much to worry about, it was clear that because of the DFSG, uh, because of what was happening in OSI, th there had to be um, a ruling by Debian. Debian was the clear tiebreaker. FSF's biased because it's their license. OSI has moved too fast and now reconsidering. If Debian says a Faro GPL is DFSG free, we're done, I think. We're really done. Because then everybody just sort of has to say, well, Debian was the real neutral party here. Uh, they were able to say, hey, this is, this is a free software license. Now, <laughs> It's very common to use this phrase, strictly now, and I'll, exp I'll, I'll make, give a few examples in a minute, that something's politically unviable. You hear, the, you hear this phrase in the, in the larger politics of the world now, very common. Well, that, that, that idea is politically unviable. And in fact, what happens is uh, people who are centrists in politics usually like to use that phrase to avoid being outflanked. So they, they go to somebody more radical. I mean, this, is, um, this was the Clinton campaign in the US was constant on this about Bernie Sanders. They would say, oh, the, uh, Bill Clinton would go out and say, well, you know, my wife's policies are politically viable. Bernie Sanders are not politically viable, right? Well, it's a way to say, well, you, you're, you're, you're a, a left-wing crazy, and, you, and you, if you get into office, you won't actually get anything done, right? That's, that's the goal there. Now, it's true, in fact, that most new political ideas are politically unviable when they first are proposed. It's actually more often than not, they are. But timing in politics is everything. Everybody thought that the idea of the United Kingdom leaving the EU was politically unviable until it wasn't politically unviable anymore. People thought that Trump being nominated as one of the major party's uh, nominees in my country was politically unviable until he was the presumptive nominee. Political talk shows, as you're from the US, political talk shows just weeks, not even weeks, a week before he had the majority of the delegates, the political talk shows on the weekends were saying, oh no, there's no way he's going to clinch his nomination, right? It was politically unviable until it wasn't politically unviable anymore. And if you're trying some political maneuver, when you do it matters much more than what it is. But doing it at the right time matters more than the idea, matters more than how many people you have on your side, et cetera. And what happens in Debian is that pretty much anybody who can upload can decide the timing. Because the new queue is the place to force a DFSG decision immediately. So when you choose to upload at the right time, you choose to force the decision about a DFSG-free ruling, which means it's easy to manipulate. So I have a friend named uh, Louis Thackeray. He uh, was involved heavily in Debian long ago. You probably don't know him because he hasn't been involved in a long time. He had actually written a replacement uh, to Google Reader, which, well, an incomplete replacement. It's still incomplete to this day. It does not help you read RSS feeds. It is basically a proof of concept uh, that you can relatively easily write a replacement to Google Reader. Uh, it doesn't actually work. But it was code, and it was under the Affero GPL. So I went and found somebody who wasn't known to be a Faro GPL ad advocate to go make in our request for packaging of Yocto Reader. 
I went back to Luik and said, OK, it's up. Let's package Octoreader. So I did the package, and Luik uploaded it uh, as, a, as a DD. So that it was in the new queue, which meant now the decision was before the FTP masters. Is the Afero GPL license DFSG free or not? Because it's in the new queue. It's got to be thought about. Now, I picked my timing carefully. I picked June 2008 for a number of reasons. Of course, as I mentioned, there was certain factions in, uh, of, uh, you know, not on the OSI board, but, but sort of close to the OSI board who were going to make their case at OSCON in July of 2008 to the OSI board members. I heard that through my back channels. And my hope, obviously my, my, my aspiration was Debbie would make a quick decision, which means by the time we got to OSCON, it would, a Faro GPL would be DFSG free. But even if that didn't happen, even if the optimal timing didn't happen, at least Debian will, have been, will be considering it by the time the OSI board is getting its maximum pressure to reconsider, which means the OSI board could easily say, well, you know what, Debian's thinking about this right now. We've already ruled. Let's not take it off the list yet until we see what Debian says. So it was an opportunity to delay the possibility of this temporary removal of the Faro GPL from the OSI's license list. And so I sort of figured at the time, I've my timing, I pretty much got to the end of 2008. Because when January 2009 rolls around, there'll probably be, you know, I, you know actually, i would seen it the previous year, that went, the reason that uh, that happened so fast in March of 2008 was Russ Nelson kept trying to clear his new queue of licenses. Um, and he did that at the beginning of 2008. So I figured he would do a similar process at the beginning of 2009 to clear his agenda. So I figured I'd need this certain before he rolls around and does that again. So. I really wanted to get quickly approved, and I figured a small program was better. Something that was not of huge interest would be easier to debate about because it's less about the code, right? What happens a lot when a very important software code base is under a dubious license, the thing is wrought with a mix of technical and licensing fights. And that conflates the two issues and makes the politics more complicated. A program like Yocta Reader that barely works, that was actually a point against me because somebody could have said, well, it barely works. Why are we putting it in the archive anyway? Uh, but it worked enough. Like it loaded something that looked good. So I figured that was enough to, it's a small program. It does something sort of, why not? Now, I kind of almost got thwarted on this because PySoy, which was actually a useful piece of code, um, <laughs> Uh, so somebody came forward and said, oh, I want to package PySoy, but it's under a fair GPL. Uh, can somebody uh, make a ruling? I got kind of lucky because the person who brought that up decided not to bother to package it. It was actually really hard to package, as it turned out, and this person was not, uh, was not particularly still in the packaging. So it never actually got packaged, but this guy did open a bug directly to the FTP masters asking the question, is the Afero GPL DFSG free? So the outcome here actually surprised me, because the outcome came out exactly as I really wanted it to. And it also ended up getting a real ruling. Now, I asked Paul, when I was prepping this talk, uh, the, you know, the early days, uh, right after I proposed it, I asked Paul Tag about some of these issues. He's, a, he's an FTP assistant. And he said, well, real, don't forget, FT, FTP masters do not decide on licenses. They decide on packages. And just because they rule about one package saying it's DFSG free doesn't mean another package, even if it's under the exact same license, is necessarily DFSG free, i.e. there is no precedence-based system in the FTP master's world. This is Paul Tag's argument. OK, I, I'm, I mean, I know people probably disagree, but this is what he argued to me. It's really true. That's the scary thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, not in this case. So this case worked out pretty well because, in fact, the FTP masters that November gave really a Supreme Court-like decision. It, it was not in form of what you would see from the US Supreme Court, but in function it was. They, had, they quoted all the arguments that people had made saying it was non-DFSG non, uh, free or DFSG non-free, and they refuted them and said, no, we don't think that's a viable argument. We think that's wrong. And they refuted all the major arguments from reasonable people and said, we're going to rule that this is DFSG free. Um, and that's linked to there in blue. So, there were a few loose ends after this happened. I promoted this on my blog to make sure that I sort of clinched the importance of it and was sure that the OSI was not going to reconsider. Um, I, I used some of my back channels to, to just sort of make sure, hey, you, OSI, you're really not going to reconsider it now that it's Debian. Like you're going to contradict Debian? Don't you remember that the OSD and the DFS G 
were drafted very similarly. Like it would be a real problem for the community if they were interpreted differently by two different orgs. <laughs> so pretty much was able to convince people that it was not going to work. Um, and I really felt that, that this, was, this was probably the only way to resolve this solution. It could have easy, it may have been all okay. Maybe OSI would not have been convinced by Google to reconsider, who knows. But this was the way to be certain, to, to really just close all the loose ends and, and make sure we got there. Now, that didn't stop the fight in Debian. Whatever does stop a fight in Debian. Um, there was a last ditch effort of filing two bugs against, specifically against Yocto Reader to try and sort of reforce a reconsideration decision. Uh, one of them was actually relatively legitimate that I closed. You'll see the link there if you want to read how we ended up closing it, because it was actually it was actually a difficulty in downstream complying uh, from the way it was packaged. I fixed that in the package. Um, but the tide had turned at that point, uh, not for Google. Uh, this is a link to a 2011 article where Chris is arguing how dangerous the Affair GPL is. He's never stopped. Um, I thought it was going to ruin my friendship with Chris. It has not, which was good. Uh, but we, 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 I try never to discuss the Affair GPL with him. He occasionally brings it up. And I say, Chris, you know we don't want to discuss that. <laughs> you know we don't want to have a debate about the Affair GPL again. Um, I know that Google will never like it. That's pretty much a certainty. Um, <clears throat> So I, I think about this series of events a lot. Like since 2008, not a month goes by that I don't replay these events in my head. And the thing that bugs me is, you know, I, as I said, I'm an accidental politician. I didn't think I was going to be a politician for a living. I thought I was going to be a, a developer or a computer scientist or something like that. Um, and you know, I, I tell the story for for laughs now. But you know, was I sleazy? I don't know. I don't actually know. And did the Debian political system function properly? Is this how it was supposed to work? Is that how the politics are supposed to play out? Or did I game the system? And I admit that I'm not biased here. I got the outcome I wanted. So part of me wants to say, well, hey, if I can game this system, I want to keep gaming it. Um, and I almost admitted this on a whim because I was like, I was like, am I going to you know, share my, my political secrets to the entire Debian community? And I decided it was the right thing to do because I, I try to be a moral person and I try not to be a sleazy politician. But I, I don't, it could not go my way in the future anyway. So it could not go any of our ways in the future. So I really think we have to reconsider and start questioning. And this is, OK, controversy begins. This is the controversial question. Why is it that the FTP masters are the ones who decide these questions? Why do we do it that way? Well, there's the delegation, right? So they are delegates of the DPL. And uh, you know, people like to point me to these other words, which I'm going to talk about more in a minute, about how the delegates, you know, the, the DPL can't overrule the delegates after the fact and so forth. So maybe that's OK. Now, the one question, my first question in that is, <clears throat> well, is that authority even delegated to the FTP masters? When you read the Debian Constitution, it says that the DFSG is under the control of the developers. And the GR should be doing the things with the DFSG, not, not, uh, not a DPL delegate, um, because that's who controls the DFSG. And I went back and read at least what I could find. This is a link to the 2012 requoting of a previous delegation that Stefano did when he was DPL. I read that delegation. It does not say anything about interpreting licenses at all. Um, so I don't, I, I don't know, I, I mean, I read this in, in one of York's uh, bits from the FTP master, but it, I don't see it in the delegation text. So is the authority to decide what DFSG means actually delegated to the FTP masters? I don't know. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. And I don't understand why such an important power is completely <laughs> consolidated in the FTP masters. They do a lot of different things. And a lot of them are not licensing. And I think one, I, honestly, I think one of the reasons, uh, maybe Luke can confirm or deny, um, one of the reasons the FTP masters like to be FTP masters is because they, this is the part they're interested in. So Luke's nodding. Um, but there's all these other technical aspects to the job as well. So I mean, it doesn't, it, somebody could be doing the technical aspects and be on a different panel that's doing licenses. There's nothing against, I don't have an objection to that. But why is it consolidated into one place? Um, and, I don't know. I think it's too important to be integrated with other tasks. I think it should be its own panel. But who knows? I don't know. I'm just making observations. I'm not sure. I'm not making a recommendation. So the other concern I have is that, generally speaking, decision making about licensing is opaque. Um, in the, the Affair GPL is the one example I found that's not. Usually, 
Um, they say they're doing consensus-based decision making to come to these conclusions, but there's no real minutes of that that show it. And it's nothing that binds them to continue to do a consensus-based process. As far as I can tell, whatever FTP master picks up something from the new queue, they can make the licensing decision if they want to and upload it if they want to. And Luke's nodding again, so that's true. So um, they aren't like court opinions, and I think they should be. We don't get them. In the Affair GPL case, is the only one I can find where there was a court opinion from the court of the FTP masters that said, we believe it's DFSG free, and here's why. I think we need to document the decisions of license interpretation. As it turns out, because I'm on the FSF board of directors, I'm part of the committee that uh, evaluates licenses for the FSF. And I'm always arguing in that committee uh, to make longer the text that the FSF releases. Like, usually there's one sentence the FSF says, this is non-free because, right? And there's like a, a short, pithy comment of why it's non-free. I'm always arguing, make that four sentences. So give four reasons why. Make it clearer. Make it more complete. And so I'm arguing for the same here. We, I want to see the, the logic and the reasoning and the refutation of the arguments that say it's not free. Even though I disagreed with all the arguments made by the Afero GPL opponents about why it was non free, I was really glad that Jorg wrote a, a complete response to those problems and said, no, these are not problems, and here's why. The other problem is precedence. If Paul Teig is actually correct that there is absolutely no precedence set by any decision made by the FTP masters. Think about this situation. What if all packages under a particular license are deleted from the archive for other reasons, right? They're just not interesting anymore. They're orphaned and nobody takes them over, whatever it is. Does that make the license not DFSG free anymore? Because there's nothing in the archive under that license? So it's unknown? Well, it, OK, it wouldn't make it not DFSG. It wouldn't make it DFSG non-free. But does, doesn't it make the question undecided again? And if there's a new delegation of FTP masters, different FTP masters, the next time something under that license is uploaded, it's evaluated again. Do they have to look back at the old precedent? Are they have any requirement to do so? Do they have to consider what happened in the past at all and try to understand its reasoning to figure out what to do next? Now, I also think about what this means in this context, right? So you look at the quote of the, this idea of the delegation, so to make sure the DPL doesn't have too much power, the DPL can't override a decision already made. But if what I said before is true, if the decision gets made anew the next time, well, over the long term, it becomes kind of meaningless, doesn't it? Because somebody could just wait <laughs> and wait until the FTP masters were a group of people they wanted, wait until things leave the archive, and then upload the package again. Ultimately, the FTP masters are political appointees. I think that trying to pretend we're not a political environment is, is putting our head in the sand. And they serve at the pleasure of the DPL, not the developers. Regardless of what that text in the Constitution says, they are the DPL's delegates. They serve at the DPL's pleasure. And yes, I know, at any point, a GR can be called to override a decision relatively easily. I mean, that's pretty much what happened with the FDL, right? But it's a, the GR, as we all know, is a very blunt instrument that's difficult to predict, difficult to use, uh, and very um, contentious to live through. And I would say it boils in the heat of the particular hot situation, right? It just makes it worse. There's this uh, phrase that uh, I forget which two uh, uh, US uh, constitutional drafters were talking. And they were talking about the issue of impeachment and how easy it was for, con for, the, for the one house to impeach someone. And uh, the one was sitting there with a cup of tea, and he said, watch when I pour some of my tea into the saucer. It cools so quickly in the saucer, but not in the cup. The cup is the house, and the saucer is the Senate. So the idea of having another, another body that's less likely to be so hot and heavy about an issue is a way to keep the separation of powers going. The GR is too politi politically wrought to be the only solution we have for situations with licensing decisions. So I think this concept is actually uh, somebody I don't usually agree with who says this. So he was actually talking about the fact that we haven't appointed a new Supreme Court justice because the Senate is refusing to hear Obama's nominee uh, right now in the US. And probably the next president will end up appointing when it really should be this president in some sense. But his point is pretty makes sense. The appointment process is political. You put all the politics up front. You fight about confirming the candidate first so that the issues 
are not so politically wrought. When, when a appointee hears the issues, they're already appointed, and they don't have to worry about being a, serving at the pleasure of some leader or some regime change may change. I believe in independent judiciary. I think policy should be interpreted and that accountability should be there for explaining the reasoning of it. And I think we should evaluate who's making these decisions, not the decisions they make. That part I really agree with, right? We want people making decisions about DFSG free who have good judgment and understand what the goal of DFSG was, how licenses work, and how they interact with DFSG. And even when they would decide against me, I'm not so worried about their specific views, but their judgment and the ability to do this analysis. And that's what I'm most interested in the political confirmation process. Um, and I don't want them to feel pressure in the context of an urgent decision. I want them to be like the Supreme Court, to sit on the bench and wait their sweet time to hear something until they believe they can think about it dispassionately and correctly. There are still lots of ways to game the system. I haven't told you all of them I've ever thought of. I'm not going to give away every political trick I have. And I don't think we should have those things. I don't think it should be political gameable. Um, and it's also disturbing to me that I don't ever see it asked in DPL, uh, DPL elections, who, who are you going to make FTP maps? Are you going to keep the ones we have? Are you going to appoint new ones? I don't see that being asked as a key question. Yet DFSG is so important, and that's where the power is with regard to DFSG. Now, I grew up in a common law country. Uh, so I, I love precedent. And I love the idea of overturning precedent is harder than confirming precedent. That, to me, feels like a comfortable thing because I've seen it my entire life. Um, but I, 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 I beg of you, those not from common law countries, to, to look at the, the value in this process. Maybe there should be an appeals court for DFSG free. Maybe it should have a separation of powers from the DPL. After all, technical decisions of Debian have that. You have the technical committee, which has a, is a separation of powers from the DPL because the constitutional drafters of Debian's constitution realized technical decisions should not be too under the control of the DPL because it's too important. You need a separation of powers. Surely interpreting the DFSG is at least as important as technical decisions. I, I would probably argue it's more important, but I'm biased as a licensing geek. Uh, but it's at least as important, in my view. Or maybe not. I don't know. Um, this joke is only going to be good for US uh, people. I apologize, because you don't, you don't know that there is a, uh, there is a fast food place uh, in the United States called Taco Bell, which you can order a taco, or you can order a Taco Supreme. And the only difference between a Taco Supreme and a taco is that the Taco Supreme has tomatoes and sour cream. So maybe the Supreme Court is just a regular court with sour cream and tomatoes. So maybe it's not that important. I don't know. Anyway, I'm happy for your questions. I'm happy for you to yell at me, whatever you feel you need to do. Hello. Hey, so, um, Brad, I think, first of all, I'd like to thank you for starting out by admitting that you're, you're nervous. It's really great to be in a community of humans. Um, that are open and willing to work with each other and, and admit their vulnerability. So I'm gonna, going to kind of respond and, and say um, my vulnerability here is that I'm afraid I want a process that's going to balance, uh, mm -hmm. that's going to be balanced, and it's mm -hmm. not just going to be uh, doing what the FSF wants or doing what you know, one, one side wants here. But I think you make some really good points, and I'd like to make you this offer that um, if you're willing to commit to working to find a process to, that's balanced, you know, a process where, for example, in the recent CFS debate, there would have been both sides represented. In, in the, like, there would have been people in the process who had both sides of some of those issues. Yeah, and, 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 I, and, and I mentioned it, but I won that one, too. Right? Yeah, I understand. I mean, <laughs> um, and, uh, I mean I, the proposal is here because I don't, I don't think it's time for proposals yet. I just have tried to boot this conversation. Uh, I think we have to have it over a period of time. Uh, and I think we have time for one more question, then I'm done, unfortunately. Go ahead. Somebody, one more? I have a mic, so I'll speak. Okay. Um, I think um, it's an interesting idea about some sort of committee that can decide on licenses. And I think the point that... I don't think you've necessarily missed, but you've just neglected to mention, 
is that the FTP masters aren't making a decision solely on licenses. So it's not the mm. right place for precedent to be established because they make a decision about is the package worthwhile in Debian? Yep. Is it technically competent? Is the license clear? Like the license may be clearly stated, but it may not be clear that everything's under that yep. license. So it, th there's no precedent there on the idea right. that because one package did or didn't get in, you can make a definite determination about the license. I mean, if, you're, if your package hadn't got yep. in, it sounds like there were a bunch of good reasons why it shouldn't have gone in anyway. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It wouldn't have been a nail in the coffin for the Apparel GPL. So, so the, the uh, FTP masters are making these decisions because there's nowhere else doing it and because it is important that they are, we are legally covered in terms of what we ship. But I, I don't think there's um, any intention that they're trying to be the guardians of mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. are and are not, yet, which is why it's not a delegated power. Yeah, and, and, I, and I probably was not as clear as I should be if, if you didn't get that. I actually agree with everything you said. It, the, the, the problem is that the, the roles are conflated, right? They're deciding a lot of things. And the, the outside world, outside of Debian, doesn't follow that nuance, right? The political, the political outcome would have been, if, if it had been, if, if Yocto Reader hadn't been let in, right? Or if, if Jorg hadn't posted that message where he may, actually made a ruling, uh, which is counter to what we've both been saying uh, in that particular case, I, th I think the OSI would have moved it to a temporary list. I think it would have been real trouble for the Faro GPL because people would have said, well, Debian won't even take it. And they're the crazy free software people like you. So if they won't take it, there's something wrong with, with your license, right? No. That's what would have happened politically, in my view. No. The B-Dale says no. Okay, but we're out of time, B-Dale, so B-Dale disagrees with me. <laughs> he, he doesn't have a microphone, so I will say B-Dale disagreed with what I just said, and we're done. <laughs>